It is now time for question period. The member from Huron Bush. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, because your cap and tax plan, you claim the cost of gas will go up three cents a litre. Well, your record says differently. We cannot trust your numbers. Minister Shirelli once said the, the rise in cost in hydro was worth about a cup of coffee. However, Ontarians across this province have seen their hydro bills nearly triple under your watch. You said the cost of gas, the gas plant scandal would be $40 million, and it ballooned to over $1 billion. Acting Premier, how much will gas increase under the Liberal cap and tax scheme? How much? Well, thank you, Speaker. And you know, I, I have to say that um, I'm disappointed in the third party, but at least they have chosen in the, in the, in the second in the opposition party. Um, they have they have chosen a side. They are opposing cap and trade. They are opposing taking action on greenhouse gas. But at least I respect them for having a position on cap and trade. They are firmly, they, they've made a big mistake on this, but they've made a decision to not to support this. The third party, I think to everyone's astonishment, Speaker, has chosen actually not to take a position. There are two sides to this debate. One, one side says, let's take action, we must take action. The other side says, Order. One sentence wrap up, please. Speaker, I respect the PC party. They have chosen a path, the wrong path, but at least they have Thank chosen you. a path. Supplementary. Speaker, I dare say we're the only party in this House that are standing up for Ontarians across this country. <laughs> cost of everything. You're feeding your spending addiction from the pocketbooks of hard-working Ontarians. Because of I expect the same when the question is put as much as an answer. Please continue. Because of high energy prices in Ontario, I often hear from people who have had to choose food over heating. You force them to pick, Acting Premier, between heating and eating. That's not the Ontario that I'm proud to say I'm a member of. You're driving people out of this province. Your cap and tax scheme will just continue to open the door and usher people and business out of this province. What will Ontarians have to sacrifice next? Their home, maybe new shoes for their children, Question. school trips for their children? Deputy Premier, what do you say to them? What next will Ontarians have to sacrifice? Thank you. Thank you. The big, the big flaw in the PC Member from Stormont, come to order. Party, is they don't recognize that there are costs attached to inaction. We are already paying the price. We're seeing increased insurance costs. Please finish. Today, um, uh, Speaker, today premiers from right across this province are joining together in the fight against climate change. These premiers represent all parties. Speaker, the, uh, the world is moving on. We recognize there is a problem that is having and will continue to have a devastating impact on our farmers, on our, our, our health, on our plants, on our animals, on our ecosystem. Speaker. We must take action. The yes, time sir. to take action is now, and there is a cost to inaction. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the cost to all of the Liberal action over this past decade has added up to $23,000 on every set of shoulders in this province. It's absolutely shameful. But again, back to Minister the Minister of Municipal Affairs, come to order. Because you because across the globe, we're seeing cap and tax systems riddled with scandal, fraud, and corrupt corruption. It's only natural for your Liberal government to jump right on that bandwagon. And I have to tell you, Acting Premier, while we support reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we will not support this being done through another irresponsible tax. You're making it harder for the average Ontarian. And the only winners in this scenario are going to be your Liberal friends. Exactly. It may be easy for you to pick winners and losers, but why should the Member from Angling to Lawrence come to order? Kids playing Question. hockey or heating their home 
as opposed to having to pay their bills. When are you going to stand up for Ontario? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, speaker, it's becoming clear that the, uh, the pro-carbon party is the best friend carbon ever had, but Speaker, what you must recognize and what we almost re must recognize is that we, we believe in the principle that the polluter should pay, and we know that when we add a cost to carbon, Speaker, businesses will reduce their, uh, their emissions because it makes sense for them to do it. Why would we not reward businesses that take action to reduce emissions, Speaker? That is at the heart of this. Across the country, the building. The member from Lapton Kent Middlesex will come to order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Carry on, please. Uh, speaker, several members of the, of the PC party have actually voted in favour of taking immediate action. That is what we were doing. But it appears to me that what's happening now is that climate change Answer. deniers are, have taken control of the PC caucus. They are the ones who are driving this change. I know there are people you. on your side who think this is— Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds Grenville. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said, call it carbon pricing, cap and trade, a market mechanism. If you must, go ahead and call it a tax. Well, Minister I'm glad we agree on something. It is a tax. It's a tax on everything. In Australia, we know it costs families $550 every year. Deputy Premier, how much money will your tax cost Ontario families? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, uh, Speaker, I, I, I think the question is, what does inaction cost Ontario families? We are already paying the price. We're paying now billions of dollars in the impact of climate change, Speaker, and that will accelerate. That will only get grow. Families are paying now. Ask the people of Burlington if climate change is impacting their cost of living. Ask the people who are affected by the ice storm if climate change is affecting their cost of living. Speaker, we are paying the price now. We will pay the price more in the future. The time to take action is now. The approach on cap and trade is the right way to go. I just wish the PCs would actually join the conference. The member can look away all he wants, but the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Second time. New question. Uh, sorry, supplementary. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Back to the Deputy Premier. Last night on uh, CBC, your Economic Development Minister, the man responsible for growing the economy, admitted that your carbon tax will take money out of companies' hands and put it into government coffers. He said it would take money out of our economy. That would mean fewer jobs. That would be the legacy of your carbon tax. Deputy Premier, how many jobs will be lost under your new carbon tax? Thank you. Speaker, once again, the question is how many jobs will be created? We are actually creating jobs the next generation of jobs. When the Premier and the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change made their announcement yesterday, they made it at a plant that produces programmable thermostats. That is a, a product that will be in demand, that is now in demand globally. It is in demand because people are trying to make wiser use of their expenditures. So when people save um, on their energy consumption speaker, they will save money. So we will reinvest the money in a very transparent way in a range of province, uh, pro uh, projects that uh, will help make help families be more energy efficient, that will build Answer. public transit to reduce congestion, that will help factories and businesses Order. reduce their pollution. This is an economic Thank generator, you. Speaker. Final supplementary. My final sub back to the uh, Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the Premier brought up the fact that she wanted to be able to tell her granddaughter what she did as Premier. She wanted to be able to say that she didn't have her head in the sand. And that's funny, because this government's had their head in the sand for the last 12 years. 
Your policies have driven jobs out of this province and have allowed our energy rates to skyrocket. Deputy Premier, is your government okay with telling our grandchildren Order. they'll have no job and they'll owe $23,000 in debt? Well, Speaker, um, they don't have to take it from me. Let's hear what Michael, Mc Michael McSweeney, President and CEO, Cement Association of Canada, has to say. He says there are good reasons, environmental and economic, to tackle greenhouse gas emissions now with some sense of urgency. We believe Ontario is on the right track with its plan to introduce cap-and-trade system for greenhouse gas. David Patterson, Corporate and Environmental Affairs, General Motors Canada. GM believes there can be opportunities in addressing climate change. We need to get on with that and do it. That's, uh, that's just about it. Every sentence. Carry on. And Newman of the Steelworkers says there's a pressing need to address climate change. And if the revenues from carbon pricing are reinvested in Ontario's economy, Answer. we can create a lot of jobs and build things we want and need, like more transit, more renewable energy, more energy efficient Thank industry. You. Speaker, there are many Thank people. You. Oh. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. For over a decade, the Liberals have been opposed to privatizing Hydro One. My question is, can the Deputy Premier tell us what's changed? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, what, uh, we in this province have a very clear uh, and tangible need to invest in infrastructure. I think many people came in today and experienced that, uh, that need themselves this morning. We must invest in infrastructure. Our people are depending on us to do that. We need to pay for it, Speaker, and we will maximize Member our assets from Hamilton, so we can East build Green. new assets like better infrastructure. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm sure the Deputy Premier remembers 2003. It was when her and her Premier were first elected. Their leader, Dalton McGuinty, at that time said, Speaker, and I quote, Ontario families want affordable, reliable electricity. They know the sale of the grid that carries electricity to their homes is a disaster for consumers, unquote. Now, can the Deputy Premier tell us whether her and the Premier believed that plan back in 2003? when they ran under it? Well, uh, Speaker, I think a lot of people are disappointed that the NDP party has become the party of the status quo. They don't want to change. They don't want to build for tomorrow's economy, Speaker. They are rooted in the past. And um, I have to say that they've opposed changes to the LCBO, opposed changes to the beer store, opposed changes. Please finish. And when they oppose any ways to fund transit, they are opposing infrastructure investment, Speaker. You cannot have it both ways. If you want to build it, you have to pay for it. The first won her seat with a team that opposed the sell-off of Hydro One. Dalton McGuinty said this about Hydro One, quote, The people have never had a say on this, not in an election, not even in public hearings. Now, this Liberal Premier, this Liberal government is planning to a sale of Hydro One without running on it in an obvious way on that plan without any hearings whatsoever with the people of Ontario, without ever explaining to people what it means or how much it will cost Ontarians on their hydro bills. So, my question is, will the Deputy Premier tell Ontarians exactly who it is that's behind the Liberals' 180-degree about-face on this call? The speaker, I, uh, uh, the people of Ontario are looking for the government to take leadership when it comes Absolutely. to building infrastructure. No matter what part of the province you go to, whether it's small communities or large communities, the, we hear over and over again that the infrastructure we have is not adequate. Our infrastructure deficit is reducing. <coughs> Finish, please. 
Our infrastructure deficit is reducing the ability of companies to create jobs. Speaker, we must act. We're acting. It's disappointing that the NDP has once again chosen to oppose without offering any constructive Answer. solutions of their own. Absolutely. Thank you. New questions. Leader of the third party. So for the uh, Deputy Premier Speaker, thanks very much. You know, it wasn't just Dalton McGuinty. The Liberal energy critic, Sean Conway, had this to say about Hydro One in 2002, the lead up to that 2003 election. Quote, the Tory government has no mandate to sell off the grid, and there has been no consultation about such a sale. The transmission grid, located in the heart of North America, is one of Ontario's most valuable assets. It is unbelievable that it is being sold without any discussion or debate. I agree, Speaker. It is unbelievable that that's happening. And yet now the Liberal government is planning to do exactly what they crowed about and opposed so vehemently a decade ago. So can the Premier or the Deputy Premier rather explain to the Portion. people of this province how and when it is that the Liberals lost their way? Um, well, Speaker, um, you know what's unbelievable? The unbelievable thing is that uh, they ran on this plan. What is unbelievable is you took the assumptions in our fiscal plan, which included max maximizing assets, and you ran on it. So it's extraordinary that you ran on it, but you didn't know about it. And talking about losing your way, Speaker, I think I have a letter here. Um, dear, dear Andrea, it's May 2014. Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. It says, we're writing to you as longtime supporters of the Ontario NDP who are deeply distressed by the current election campaign. In this election, we're seriously considering not voting NDP. We were angry Answer. when you voted against the most progressive budget in recent Ontario history. I know they take offence, but let's see. Kathy Crow signed this Thank letter. You. Martha Friendly. Supplementary. You'll be getting some dear Kathleen and dear Deb letters pretty soon when the, with the direction you're going through right now. Just Dalton McGuinty, Speaker, or Sean Conway. Even Dwight Duncan, the former Liberal Finance Minister, said this about asset sales: "Quote: We are certainly not going to rush anything, and we're not going to do it without what I would call a very robust and meaningful public consultation." And yet here we are with a Liberal Premier who claims to be the most progressive leader since Confederation, planning asset sales without any consultation. What? So ever. Wow. Exactly how progressive is that? Well, Speaker, I, I hate to go back, but I will to this letter uh, from NDP supporters who say they were angry when when the NDP voted against the most progressive budget in recent Ontario history. They say you've not explained to the NDP voters why this will be a successful election strategy and why they should vote against their principles. Thank you. Thank you. To continue, it, it seems in your rush to the centre, you're abandoning those whose values and constituencies that your party has always championed. If the NDP does not stand with working people, who Member people from Essex women, come to order. then what does it stand for? We urge you to change course. Speaker, Grace Edward Galabuzzi Answer. signed this letter. Michelle Landsberg signed this letter. Jeff Bickerton, Patrick Chorney Rubin, Patricia Chorney Rubin. Speaker, the no, the list is stopping. Final Folks are carefully watching the right-wing turn that the Liberals have taken, Speaker. Yeah. Privatization and the bottom, of it, the, bottom, the bottom line, Speaker, is privatization of hydro is a very, very bad idea. It always Minister has of economic been. Development. We know firsthand that private hydro drives bills through the roof. It is bad for family, Speaker, and it is bad for businesses. The plan doesn't make sense, and the Liberals know it. Ontarians deserve to know how and why the Liberals lost Horses. their way when it comes to public hydro. Can the Deputy Premier explain why the Liberals are
are taking a page from Mike Harris and Ernie Eves' playbook and planning to privatize Hydro One when they know full well that it is a very, very bad idea. Well, Speaker, you know, as I said yesterday, the easy part of being in opposition is that you get to oppose. The harder part, but the part where you have a real responsibility, is to actually provide constructive advice. So you say you want to build transit. You want to build transit, but you oppose it every step of the way. Once again, you're opposing investments in transit, in other kinds of infrastructure across this province. If you have a better way to pay for it, Speaker, we would love to hear that. We are committed to moving this forward, province forward, to building this province up, and we will do that by investing in much needed infrastructure. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Experts are warning us that your cap-and-trade tax scheme is vulnerable to fraud, manipulation, higher costs to businesses, and job losses. Now, the member from Leeds-Grenville asked you specifically how many jobs will be lost. You wouldn't answer him, so let's reach into the gas plant scandal file once again and read the confidential advice to Cabinet. Your own file tells you how many job losses your carbon tax will bring to Ontarians. The once secret document states 5,000. The Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure will come to order a second time. Your once secret document states 5,000 jobs will be lost and result in, quote, a relocation of Question. business to lower, lower cost jurisdictions. Deputy, why does it always take a secret document to get us the truth in this legislature? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker. What is very much on the public record is that the PC party has been taken capture by the climate change deniers, Speaker. The member for uh, Lennox, 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 Lennox and Addington said last June, I'm very skeptical of climate change. We can't worry about what's going to happen in 50 years. The member for Carleton, Mississippi Mills said, CO2 is a positive gas. We need CO2. There is a positive side to that. Speaker, I know there have been many voices, including the member from Nipissing, who says we must take action. The question is, why are you now saying that this action is the, not what we should be doing? The, the business community has Answer. been vocal, Speaker, in their support of this because they see the opportunities. I think you should see those opportunities, too. Uh, Speaker, Deputy Premier, you knew about the 5,000 job loss number. You were in Cabinet when this was presented. Finance Ministry officials told you about the job losses from your new revenue tools. So let's add the Ministry numbers up. I know they hurt to hear these facts. 54,000 jobs lost in your pension tax scheme. They said your cap-and-trade tax scheme will slash another 5,000 jobs or more. Deputy, look around you. Can Ontario afford to lose another 60,000 jobs? You say this is about emissions, but we all no, it's only about the cash Minister needed to fuel your sport. spending addiction. So what do you have to say now to those 5,000 families who are about Question. to pay for your latest tax grab? Thank you. Well, Speaker, um, this is interesting coming from the party that committed to firing 100,000 people. Business leaders, Speaker. They say, we support your government's intention to take measures to address climate change by establishing a transparent economy wide price on carbon, 
we share your conviction that the test of a successful climate policy is one that also enhances our competitiveness and long-term prosperity. Speaker, a number of people signed this letter, including people from Hula Packard, Tembeck, Tech Resources, Investico Capital, the Cooperators Group, Desjardins Group, Jacob Securities, Van City, Mountain Equipment Co-op, the Cement Answer. Association of Canada, Walker Industries, Interface Inc., Catalyst Paper, Phillips Light in Canada, Hydrogenics. Thank you. The New question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Minister, last night my colleague uh, from Windsor West and I attended a meeting in Amherstburg where that community, along with Harrow and Kingsville, are being forced to pick and choose which community will get to keep its school. We listened as hundreds of parents gathered for an opportunity to speak speak out, but the meeting was limited to only 90 minutes of comments. Many did not get a chance. Minister, why is this government silencing communities that desperately want to say in, in their school closures by cutting the required amount of community meetings in half? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how he thinks I determine the length of a meeting, but whatever. Um, but what I think really is quite interesting, Speaker, is that there are a number of people on the side opposite who actually have a history as school trustees, as do I, as do a number of people on our side. And I think we need to think about the history of the people who are actually trustees. So, for example, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo uh, the member from Kitchener Waterloo, when she was a trustee, supported a motion to close Allison Park Public School and a motion to close Lincoln Avenue wow. Public School. Wow. And you mentioned the, uh, the men member Answer. from Windsor West. When the member from Windsor West was, uh, was a trustee on the Greater Essex County Thank District you. School Board. Supplementary. The member of the member from Windsor West. Speaker, again to the Minister of Education. Minister, this government's choice to continue to use a flawed funding formula forces trustees to close schools, which means this government. means, Minister, is this government's record for closing schools far exceeds any Deputy trustee. Minister, it was clear last night that the communities affected are deeply concerned with what's happening to their schools. Parent after parent came forward with innovative ideas on expanding the role of their schools in vibrant community hubs. Instead of taking a proactive approach to the creation of community hubs, this government has chosen to ignore the concerns of families and close schools. Shot. When will this government recognize the importance of neighbourhood schools, stop ignoring Question. the concerns of families, and stop closing schools? Thank you. So let me just finish here. When the member from Windsor West was a trustee, she supported the closure of Forrester Secondary School. She supported the closure of Victoria Public School. She did not oppose the closure of Percy. The member from Essex will come to order a second time. Carry on, please. And she didn't. Carry on. And she didn't oppose the closure of Ruth Van or Kingsville Public Schools because what they recognized was as demographic shift, things need to shift. But what she's failing to recognize is that, in fact, we have put in the budget a 750 million school consolidation fund to help local boards do exactly what she's asking, create community hubs. Thank you. New question, the member from Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question. Member from Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, I understand that this morning you visited the Digital Media Zone at Ryerson University. 
The DMC is one of Canada's largest business incubators and working spaces for entrepreneurs, and it's based right here in Toronto. This unique community is home to entrepreneurs and innovators of all ages. In fact, innovation and encouraging Ontario's young entrepreneurs to succeed, ensuring that Ontario is globally competitive, are key priorities for this government. In light of this, could the Minister of Finance please tell us more about his visit to the Digital Media Zone at Ryerson University this morning? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member from Burlington for the question. Mr. Speaker, the member is quite right. The DMZ is a top-ranked university incubator in Canada and fifth in the world. It's a unique hub that helps startups succeed by connecting businesses with customers and young entrepreneurs. The member from Burlington is also quite right in the fact that encouraging and fostering innovative ideas is a key priority of this government. Investing in young entrepreneurs in Ontario, the future leaders of tomorrow, is a key component of the 2015 budget. And Mr. Speaker, I had the pleasure today to announce that budget date, and I am privileged to be able to table and deliver the 2015 budget in this very House on Thursday, April 23rd, oh, 2015. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Minister of Finance, I, and I'd like to thank him for his leadership. Minister, I'm pleased to hear of the government's focus on supporting entrepreneurs and continuing to ensure that Ontario is an innovative hub, not just in North America, but globally. It is fascinating projects like the DMZ at Ryerson University and innovative conversations happening in my own riding of Burlington in partnership with McMaster University that will help to make this future a reality. Mr. Speaker, I'm also pleased to hear that the 2015 budget will be tabled next week on Thursday. Thursday, April 23rd. I know that the people of Ontario, the people in my riding of Burlington, and indeed all MPPs are eager to hear about our government's next steps in building Ontario up. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Finance please Question. tell this House a bit about the upcoming 2015 Ontario budget? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for Burlington for a great question. The budget will focus on four-part plan to build Ontario up. It'll continue to build in a dynamic, innovative, and competitive business environment. Another pillar will be to continue to invest in our people, especially young entrepreneurs. We'll also continue to invest and build in our infrastructure through unlocking those very assets that we hold so dear. And we will continue to ensure that hardworking people of Ontario receive the retirement security that they well deserved. Mr. Speaker, last June, the people of Ontario gave us a strong mandate to continue to build a better future for the people of this wonderful province. And with the 2015 budget that's going to be coming out, we are doing just that. On April 23rd, I look forward to tabling what I believe to be one of the most progressive and innovative budgets Answer. the people of Ontario will ever have seen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oxford. Mr. the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, the Housing Services Corporation pays for its operations by overcharging social housing providers for natural gas and insurance. Instead of providing housing for our most vulnerable, the money is paying for international travel and investments in Manchester, England. Oh. City Housing Hamilton reported that in one year they paid more than a million dollars extra because they have to buy through the Housing Service Corporation. A million dollars, Mr. Minister. That's rent supplements for 140 families. Minister, if Housing Services Corporation is siphoning more than a million dollars out of Social Housing Hamilton, how much is it costing Toronto community housing? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, first off, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to correct a uh, blatant inaccuracy from the uh, member opposite when he Fix that. suggested the other day, uh, quite with a great degree of disingenuousness, that uh, the, minister will, the minister will withdraw. Thank you. He, he uttered a number of terminological inexactitudes. <laughs> That's much better. No better. Withdraw. Oh, withdraw. Was very good. That was close. When he suggested that we had removed uh, the, the Housing Services doctor. Corporation from the sun, Sunset West, he ought to know, I think he does know, uh, Mr. Speaker, that that you only get reported on the Sunshine West if you're receiving government funds. And, the, and they set it up that way when they put the legislation in place. Answer. That only happened once, and during that year it was reported. So, so he's incorrect. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Minister, it isn't just Hamilton and Toronto. Housing Services Corporation cost Peel Housing $200,000 in one year, in Waterloo $10,000 each year, in Thunder Bay $750,000. Bruce County, Oxford, Hastings, Halton, Prince Edward, Lennox, Addington, if they weren't required to purchase services through Housing Services Corporation, they could all help people who need social housing. Minister, a hundred housing providers who buy their insurance from someone else are still forced to pay two and a half percent to the Housing Services Corporation. Will you support my bill and save housing providers millions of, and allowing them to buy the services at the best possible price, price they can find in the open market? Thank you, Minister. Well, your bill will be debated. The honourable member's bill will be debated very soon, and we'll see where uh, where people uh, align themselves on that. I can say, I can say uh, for the record that the Housing Services Corporation is an independent, non non profit corporation. Uh, their board is responsible for monitoring. Uh, they made a number of changes at my request, and we're currently undergoing a third-party independent member review from of the corporation and all its subsidiaries. I'd ask the honourable member to to wait till we get that report, which will be coming very soon. If if there are things we need to change as a government as a result of that, you can be darn sure we're going to do it. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Last month, Niagara Falls hosted a rally to show its united support of daily all-year GO service all the way to Niagara Falls. The people want this, regional councils want this, and the member from St. Catharines, who is the chair of the government's cabinet, spoke at the rally, spoke at the rally on the need of daily GO service to Niagara Falls. In fact, during the election campaign, the member from St. Catharines said, quote, I can see it coming in 2015, unquote. Niagara is united in calling for all-year daily GO service all the way to Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, was the government's cabinet chair correct to tell the people of Niagara that they can expect, expect Question. daily all-year GO, GO rail service to Niagara Falls by 2015? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I actually want to begin uh, by saying that I appreciate this question from this member. I believe this is actually the very first question this member has had the opportunity to ask me since becoming uh, the NDP's transportation critic, and I applaud him for becoming the critic for transportation, and I thank him very much for that question. Speaker, I've had the opportunity on a number of occasions to speak with representatives from the region of Niagara, and in fact, as that member knows, uh, our member, uh, the, my esteemed colleague, the member from St. Catharines, has been a very persistent and staunch advocate for additional infrastructure improvements and advancements and investments uh, in Niagara Region, including Niagara Go Service. My understanding, Speaker, is that the region of Niagara is, uh, Niagara Region is working very hard with respect to the development of a business case. I look forward to, over the next couple of weeks, to having the chance to meet with them. Uh, to hear directly from them about Answer. the findings of their business case, and the Ministry of Transportation and Metrolinx will work with the region to study and analyze that business case and to continue Thank to you. work uh, on moving forward. Thanks very much. Mr. Speaker, Minister, during the last election, the leader of your party and the Premier of Ontario said that bringing the GO train all the way to Niagara Falls, and I quote, was a high, high priority. Despite this, Niagara is not mentioned anywhere in the Metrolinx report. You won't commit to a timeline, and now Metrolinx is telling us it's not a priority. The incredible grassroots organization continues to call for this for Niagara, and they have the support of all the mayors, the councils, regional councils, and even the chair of your caucus. Can you tell the people of Niagara if this government plans to follow through on its words and bring daily two-way GO service to Niagara Falls in 2015? Question. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, again, I thank that member for his follow-up and for his obvious passion on this issue. I think 
I think that member needs to recognize, as everyone does on this side of the House, is that we go forward with our infrastructure investments and how we uh, prioritize those, that all of our decisions regarding these matters will be based on a demonstrated business case and consideration of provincial infrastructure and budget priorities. And as I mentioned, Speaker, I look forward to receiving that business case. Metrolinx is already working with Niagara Region. We've heard certainly from the member from St. Catharines. But, Speaker, people watching these proceedings at Please finish. Speaker, as I was saying, people watching these proceedings from home, from Niagara Region, would have to remember that when that party had the opportunity to support our plan to invest $29 billion Answer. over the next 10 years, they chose to reject it not once, but twice, Speaker. We're going to get the job done. We're going to move the province forward. Thanks very much. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. Member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. The Premier has prioritized burden reduction so that businesses, small and large, can continue to grow across the province. In my riding of Newmarket Aurora, businesses have been asking me about this very important issue. Burden reduction was a prominent theme in both the 2014 speech and budget and has also included, uh, is also included in the Minister's public mandate letter. Just recently, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses uh, released their provincial report card on this subject. Will the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure please inform this House on Ontario's standing? Thank you. Minister, of, Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Newmarket Aurora for, for what is a really important question for us as an economy and certainly for our small business community. Mr. Speaker, since 2008, our government has eliminated more than, more than one in six regulatory requirements, or 80,000 regulatory burdens. That's significant, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, it, we're working towards achieving our burden reduction strategy, which will save close to $100 million by 2016-17 for small businesses. Very important for our economy. Because of these accomplishments, in CFIB's 2015 Red Tape Report Card, Ontario's strategic approach to burden reduction has earned this province a B plus, tying for, tying for second, Mr. Answer. Speaker, uh, with one other province uh, for the highest mark in the country. We're proud of that record, Mr. Speaker, but a B Thank plus you. as far as I can. Thank you. I'm also very proud of our government's strategic approach to burden reduction. CFIB, uh, CFIB's grade for Ontario further demonstrates the progress we've made. As I understand it, CFIB also praised our government for reintroducing and passing Bill 7, the Better Business Climate Act. This bill received all party support in its passing. Would the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure please inform this House on the importance of Bill 7 for government burden reduction? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member. I want to thank all parties in the House for supporting Bill 7. Uh, this legislation is a clear reflection of our government member working with Timmins, key stakeholders to continue to grow Ontario's economy through burden reduction and cluster development, which is also really important. It was the CFIB's biggest ask, Mr. Speaker, a couple of years ago, and I give my predecessor credit as well for for putting the uh, the the, build, the beginnings of this bill together. Uh, it creates an open and transparent commitment to uh, burden reduction. In many ways, it holds our government's feet to the fire. We have to report annually now on burden reduction, which is why the CFIB wanted us to work with, with uh, them to do that. We continue to be a national leader in reducing burden, Mr. Speaker, but there's much more work to do, and yes, I'm sir. looking forward with this government to working with the CFIB to continue to ensure Ontario is a national leader in reducing regulatory burden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, member from Rimsen, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Rural and Food, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, over the past several years, the Ontario Maple Syrup Producers Association has called on both the federal and provincial governments to adopt the standards of the international grading system to help consolidate maple syrup producers, packers, distributors, and consumers. The federal government has listened, 
by implementing recent amendments to the maple products regulations and is being commended for their efforts as this new uniform system will make it easier for consumers to identify and buy exactly what they want. Minister, will your ministry follow suit by amending and aligning our provincial rules with the federal ones to ultimately modernize the maple syrup industry here in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank uh, very much the Honourable Gentleman from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, for asking me a question about the maple syrup industry in the province of Ontario. Uh, we recognize on all sides of the House that the maple syrup industry is one of the oldest agriculture industries in the province of Ontario. Some 2,500 producers currently exist in Ontario. We harvest about 1.5 million litres of syrup, making Ontario one of the top three producers in Canada grossing over $32 million in maple product sales and contributing over $53 million in Canada's GDP. Mr. Speaker, we're very aware that the new standards that have been brought in by the federal government, and I wanted to commend my good friend Ray Bonnenberg, President of the Maple Syrup Producers Association yes, of Ontario, sir. for keeping his members engaged on this very important file. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, as you know, this is not the first time we've talked about this. I've written you, I've, I've spoke to you about it on several occasions on behalf of Mr. Bonnenberg and the industry. This issue is very important to the industry. Its members don't have the luxury of waiting around while you and your ministry get your act together. This puts Ontario at a disadvantage, which, which can no longer continue to go unaddressed. The provincial government needs to move forward as quickly as possible so that there's harmonization of the maple syrup grades. Minister, you and your ministry have been dragging your feet and holding these amendments up to the detriment of our maple syrup producers. The time to act is now. Will you stop delaying and make the necessary amendments to Regulation 19119-11 before you head off on your trade mission to China? Help our industry before you head away. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in fact, in response to my good friend, I'll be in China selling maple syrup products yeah, produced yeah, right here. Right. Mr. Speaker, we are taking a bit of uh, responsible time to consult with small, medium and large maple syrup producers of the province of Ontario. Consultations will seek to identify and adjust, adjust requests made by maple producers, including the grading and classification of maple products. We want to have a robust consultation, and we're aiming to have something in place by January 1, 2016. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's our view when it comes to this policy, we want to make sure we're in the sweet spot with regards to maple syrup in Ontario. Thank you. New questions? The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. The Hamilton Port Authority continues to push ahead with plans for a risky garbage gasification plant on Hamilton Harbour. This plant would use unproven technology that exists nowhere else in the world, save for a single small pilot project in England. Last November, I asked the Minister of Environment and Climate Change to designate this project for a full environmental assessment. After assuring that asked that, of course, there will be an environmental assessment. Five months later, the minister has done nothing, Speaker. The city's outside experts say that a full environmental assessment is absolutely necessary. Will the Liberals listen to the experts and designate this massive and risky gasification plant for a full environmental assessment? Thank you. Uh, well, Speaker, the, um, as, the, as the member knows, the Minister of, Ener of uh, Environment and Climate Change is in Quebec with the Premier, um, working with other Premiers and other governments to develop an appropriate response to, uh, to climate change and uh, the cap and trade, Speaker. So I'm sure the, the Minister will very much want to answer this question. I have been handed a note, but I suspect you would like uh, the answer from the Minister. We'll make sure you get that answer. Supplementary. Away. The report from the city's experts says the Hamilton gasification plant needs a full environmental assessment. It says the plant would be, quote, the first commercial implementation of this type in the world. There is no similar scale operational system using this technology, unquote. In other words, you can't simply scale up the results from a tiny pilot project in England, as the proponent wants to do, and expect to understand the true environmental impact of this unproven technology in a project 
project of this size. And yet, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change is ready uh, to bet the future of Hamilton Harbour on the results of a science fair project. Will the Liberals listen to the people of Hamilton and the experts who wrote this report and order a full environmental assessment? Thank you. Deputy the Minister of the Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned, the minister is not here today, and I don't have a response from him directly uh, on the particular issue that the uh, that the member has raised, the leader of the th third party. I do have a note, however, on Hamilton Air issues generally, and I can give you some of that information. In 2011, the ministry introduced new or updated air standards for eight substances which are linked to health effects such as cancer, uh -huh. developmental effects, or respiratory illnesses. These air standards uh, take effect July 1, 2016. Uh, improving air quality and combating sources of air pollution is a top priority for the ministry, and the ministry has issued site-specific standards Order, for suspended particulate matter at four of Ontario's iron and steel facilities. So this is in the context of Hamilton air issues generally. I don't have a note for her specifically on the issue that she's raised here today, but hopefully some of this uh, information will provide some level of comfort that the ministry is on the issue with when it comes to Hamilton Thank you. air issues, generally speaking. Thank you. Member from Kitchener South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Now, we all know that our population is aging, and so too are the many long-term care homes across the province that house our elderly population. And while the care and delivery each and every day by our nurses, personal support workers, doctors, physiotherapists, and other frontline health professionals is nothing short of excellent, we also want to ensure that our loved ones are in the best possible facilities. In the fall, the minister announced incentives for operators to renew hundreds of older long-term care homes in communities from one end of Ontario to the other. Mr. Speaker, could the minister provide an update to the House on the status of that important project. Thank you. Associate Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and absolutely, I'd be delighted to give an update. I want to begin by thanking the member from Kitchener Centre for the question and all of her advocacy uh, for our seniors in this province. Now, I know that for our residents, a long term care home is just that a home. And all Ontarians who make long-term care facilities their home deserve to live in comfortable, inviting and safe environments, Speaker. And that is why our government is providing increased support to long-term care home operators to reach our goal of redeveloping 30,000 long-term care beds. That's about 300 homes, Speaker. That's almost 50 percent of our homes are going to be modernized. We've been working with the sector to refine our supports in order to ensure this redevelopment program is successful. Answer. And we recently distributed a survey to all our operators because we want to do this in a collaborative fashion. Thank you. The results have been great, Speaker, and I look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is encouraging to hear the Minister's commitment to ensuring that older Ontarians are getting the best care in the best environment possible. The minister noted in her answer that our government is working with stakeholders to bring about this very substantial undertaking, and that kind of collaboration is essential for any project of this scale. Long-term care home operators do have a vital role to play in seeing the success of the redevelopment of these plans. But the voices of residents and their loved ones are just as important. Could the minister please tell us what she is doing to ensure that all parties are at the table? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, thanks to the member for Kitchener Centre. And she's absolutely right. We want this to be a collaborative process in which all stakeholders, whether they're operators, whether it's the LIN, whether it's families, whether it's residents, that they all have a say. And that's why my ministry has established a stakeholder advisory group to guide us through redevelopment, which includes representatives, as I said, of operators, LINs, municipalities, family councils, and resident councils. My ministry is also in the process of conducting collaborative information sessions for stakeholders at locations across Ontario. I also want to take a minute to give a shout out to the former Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, who actually launched this process. So thank you so much, Minister Matthews. Here, here. And I want to thank our stakeholders. I want to thank our stakeholders, as well as the folks in my ministry, the uh, health capital branch, who have been truly burning the candle at both ends to make this a success. Thank you. Hey, hey. Thank you.
Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, your government has stated public policy will be based on science and evidence. With Bill 45, you have done a grave disservice to the people of Ontario, and it is contrary to both science and evidence. Countless studies and research have proven that vaporizers are the most effective smoking cessation tool. They have been demonstrated to be up to a hundredfold more effective than nicotine patches, gums, or inhalers. Minister, Bill 45 is entitled Making Healthier Choices Act, yet you are taking away the most effective choice available to those trying to quit smoking and to live a healthier lifestyle. Minister, will you consider this overwhelming evidence in favour of the use of vaporizers as a cessation tool? Or would you rather keep these people addicted to tobacco? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. And thank you uh, to the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Long -term, uh, Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for that question. And I want to assure the member opposite that our goal in Ontario is to help smokers stop smoking, because that's the one way we're going to reduce smoking rates in Ontario. So what we've done with Bill 45, Mr. Speaker, is actually taken a middle-of-the-road, responsible approach, because we're not banning e-cigarettes. We're not banning e-cigarettes. They continue to be legal, but what we're trying to do is to make sure that people who don't smoke at all, that our youth don't start taking up e-cigarettes and electronic cigarettes. So, so, Mr. Speaker, what we've really done is really taken a very responsible approach, balancing both sides, so making sure that yes, smokers have the opportunity to switch to vaping if they should uh, so want, but also making sure that those who don't smoke at all don't Thank start you. vaping. Here, Thank here. you, Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, it is not a middle-of-the-road approach, it is an extreme approach. I can tell you the personal story of Brian Letts, who after smoking for 53 years, finally quit smoking three years ago with a vaporizer. Or I can share with you the expert advice of Dr. Batnagar, a professor and practicing cardiac surgeon with the University of Toronto. The professor has researched the use of vaporizers and has testified to how they are drastically reducing tobacco harm in our society. Minister, in this case, the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly against your government's position. Minister, will you listen to those that have finally been able to quit smoking and those in the medical and academic community who know that it is safe and abandon Question. your attack on people who want to quit smoking? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I want to assure the member opposite that his constituent can continue to vape cigarettes. And I respect Dr. Bhatnagar very much, but I also know that he runs an online vape store. So, you know, there's, uh, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to continue to say that we believe that this is the right approach that our bill is taking. We've done wide uh, stakeholder consultations, and we look forward to uh, this bill going through committee. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. The member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Ontario's Wilderness Discovery Camp in northwestern Ontario enables persons with disabilities and their families to enjoy time outdoors thanks to their accessibility and to their facilities. However, the handicapped action group who operates this camp will be forced to shut its doors unless the financial picture changes dramatically. For years, the province of Ontario has been leasing this land to the camp, but the lease is up and now the province wants to sell the land the camp is built on for more than this non-for-profit organization can afford. Will this government commit to working with the Handicapped Action Group on a financial solution that will keep Ontario's Wilderness Discovery Camp doors open? Thank you. Minister National Resources and Forestry. Thank you, and I want to thank the, the member for the question. Um, Nobody has been forced to do anything. I would think that the member would likely be aware of that. Uh, I've spent a great deal of time uh, working with Executive uh, Director David Shannon on this file, as has my colleague, the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, to repeat 
a handicap action group incorporated has not been forced to do anything they have very clearly in their press release that they put out just this week made a decision operationally on how they're going to deal with this issue it is not in any way a decision that's being forced upon them they have decided uh, decided on their own to take the resources that they have that they fundraise there's never been operational support for the facility from the government of ontario never they've decided to take their operational money Answer. that they use to fund that resort and create new programming that they're going to use that money to provide for their clients. That's what they've decided to do. The choice is theirs. Thank we you. support them in the direction that they've chosen. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the minister. The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act states that our province will be accessible to the 1.8 million Ontarians with disability by 2025. But 10 years later, it seems that our province is abandoning Ontarians with disabilities by forcing this camp's closure. The current cost of operating this camp is roughly $200,000 a year, which has been raised primarily through donations and fundraising. Petitions from concerned families and campers have already exceeded 20,000 signatures. Will this government do what it needs to do to save and support Wilderness Discovery Resort for the disabled before they sell Question. this crown land to the highest bidder. Thank you. Well, sir. Speaker, listen, I know that the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Immigration would love to, to weigh in on this, but uh, this is a, a question that I think I'm going to, with his indulgence, I'm going to keep. This is not in any way a decision that is being forced upon this group. The uh, indication for me very clearly to Executive Director Shannon was we would be more than happy to work with him on a longer-term solution to do anything that we needed to do. And we have had discussions already in that regard with the minister responsible through Infrastructure Ontario for the property. The organization has made their decision on their own to take the money that they fundraised, they always did, there was never operational support from the province of Ontario, and they've made a decision to offer new and different programming to their clients. I would add as well, Speaker, on this issue, that many of the clients who were receiving the benefit of that resort were not clients from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, or even from Northern Ontario. Answer. There were very few clients that, were, uh, that received support from Hagee that were actually taking advantage of this particular facility. The new program is, is likely to offer them greater opportunities through Haggy and I support the Thank you. Point of order from the member from Bruce Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just like to make the House aware that the Ontario Dental Association will be playing the legislators tonight at the what's the rink? Upper Canada. Upper Canada College, and uh, we welcome her to be out. We need lots of fans. The pursuant to standing order 38A, the member. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Oxford has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing concerning social housing. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.